So I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. It's great to see you here today. And um, as the new year gets underway, so 2023 and also year of the rabbit, um, let's take a moment to just feel grateful for the land that we're on and to remember that all of this country resides on either the traditional or treaty or unceded lands of Métis, Inuit and First Nations peoples. And for those of us in Guelph, that means we're on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, who are one of the Inishi Malbec people. Um, and if you saw the news on Saturday about the class action suit that's just been um, uh, agreed with the government, um, 325 indigenous nations, so that's around half of them in this country, um, won uh, $2.8 billion dollars to recognize the loss of cultural heritage that was caused by the residential school system. And the Mississaugas of the Credits were one of those 325 nations. I just thought that was a little bit of good news and probably about time too. Um, okay, so without further ado, I will now, um, I'm really happy to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Nienke van Staveren um, is from the Netherlands, not Belgium, sorry about that folks. <laughs> um, and she completed her MSc at Wageningen University, then moved to Ireland to do her PhD. And she got a PhD in vet veterinary medicine from the University College Dublin in collaboration with the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Agency. And then she moved here for a postdoctoral post with Dr. Alexandra Harlander. And now she's working with Dr. Christine Bays, um, looking at how to optimize welfare, welfare related traits in dairy cattle. So Nienka has around 40 papers published. She's been really active. She's got an H index of 14, which is pretty fantastic. And in 2022, she was nominated with actually Dr. Harlander as one of the nominees as um, a U4 Early Career Animal Welfare Researcher of the Year. It's really fantastic. And she won that award partly because she's so good at combining fundamental and applied approaches in her work and partly because she's just worked with such a diverse collection of species as well. So she's sort of wide ranging in her thinking. She's worked with pigs and poultry and more recently, as I said, ruminants. Um, so here she's here today to talk to us about the importance of feathers in poultry welfare. I'm sure we've all seen pictures or maybe even real life, in real life we've seen this, laying hens looking a bit kind of ratty in an intensive production system. Is that an aesthetic issue or does it actually indicate something more worrying about animal welfare? That's what we're going to learn about today. Thank you, Nienka. Thank you, Georgia. Um, it's kind of exciting to be back in the room. I didn't actually realize that I was kicking off the 2023 series. So way to put on the pressure. Um, but yeah, no, I'm gonna actually go over feathers in general a little bit because when I first came to Guelph, I was working with Cassandra Harlander, um, and I very much focused on feather pecking research. So that's a very specific topic. Um, and as the years come by, I've sort of realized it also goes broader. So I want to go a little bit across different fields and how feathers play a role in that in in welfare research. And so I heard that there was a group here that was worried I was going to ask questions. I'm going to do it the other way around. And I'll let you know when I started. Uh, my family was actually being quite smart about it because they were asking me questions. And they were talking about how many feathers is a chicken actually supposed to have? And I didn't know. Um, and I still don't think I have very accurate numbers on that. But I came across this which is keep going okay which is um quite funnily named improbable research but it turns out uh there are actually some accounts of people doing this work and actually checking okay how many feathers does a bird actually have so turns out some reports are saying there's over twenty thousand feathers on a bird uh general idea larger birds more feathers and if it comes to commercial poultry Estimates are more or less between 7,000 and 9,000 feathers or about 3 to 6% of their body weight. So if anyone asks now, we have vague numbers. I'm not sure how accurate or how reliable they are, but there are some thoughts about it. Um, and I think more importantly, we have all these many feathers, but they also have many different functions. And there was a quite recent review that actually nicely summarized these different functions and they also tried to visualize it 
Um, so first of all, when you're thinking about feathers, it's good to know they actually are useful because they protect the skin, they protect the body, but also other feathers that are underneath. Um, so that's sort of what they try to show with these pictures. Um, it also plays a role in thermal regulation and waterproofing. So that's why the birds that live on water uh, have their buoyancy as well in part, and then also a large role in communication. And that can be different forms of communication. It can be um, sexual signaling or any sort of communication related to predation or paternal care or um, trying to deter up predators. So this really strange looking bird there in um, letter D. I don't think I've ever seen a bird like that, but apparently what they think is that that plumage is trying to mimic uh, toxic caterpillars. So that's a way to avoid any sort of predators. And then last, I think the more obvious function uh, that we associate with feathers and with birds is locomotion, particularly flights. But also here, they use it for more than just flying. It's also used for maneuvering around or balancing and bracing themselves against vertical structures. So that's what you see in letter C. Um, that bird is using its tail feathers to brace against a vertical structure. So many different functions. Um, they listed them all out in that particular review. And I think they came up with at least 26 different functions for feathers. So very many commercial poultry, not all of these will be relevant, but I think it's good to have this in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. And I've sort of split the presentation up into two different parts because I am gonna cross a couple of different research projects. Um, but first of all, Apart from understanding the functions, I think it's also good to have a bit of understanding about the biology and how these feathers are actually formed and how they develop over time. So if you look at the very basics of feathers, there's uh, different structures and different types of feathers that cover different parts of the body of a bird. Um, but if you look at the more common components, so you have the calamus, which inserts uh, in the body, and then you have the feather shaft and the feather vein. Um, but if you zoom in more closely, then you'll see those feather veins are made up out of branching structures, these barbs. And going in more detail, also from the barbs, you have branching structures. So those are the barbels and booklets. And these are actually connected. They connect quite strongly. So it's sort of like Velcro they say, um, and this is what gives light feathers, for example, their strength. But you don't see this in every type of feathers. So the downy feathers, um, there the barbs stay loose from each other, and that makes it more pliant. And it's also why those types of feathers are better suited for thermal regulation or keeping the body warm. So all those feathers, um, different body areas, as I said, so you have different groups of feathers as well. And this is just a schematic to more or less show how you can group them, how you can group these different areas. If we're talking about feathers, usually we talk about the flight feathers, so the feathers on the wing or the tail or uh, flight. But you also have those feathers, for example, on the neck or the hackles. Uh, that's, for example, in chickens, something they use for communication. So if they're threatening one another, they will raise those feathers. And as you can imagine, there's quite some differences in the size and in the shape of all these feathers. So in birds, if you go from the smallest to the largest feather, it can go between or go up in a factor of about a thousand. Regardless of how big that feather is, all of its formation or the formation of the follicles from which they grow is happening during embryogenesis. So it's forming in very um, distinct tracks, those follicles, and that covers about 75% of the skin. But then in the end, when the feathers grow and the way they are angled around the body, it actually covers the entire animal um, in most birds. And it starts during incubation, the whole process. And in the case of chickens, it's complete about two to three days before hatch, and then they're born with those downy uh, feathers. 
And the interesting thing with how feathers are formed is actually it's the tip of the feather or the more distant part that is formed first. So as you move along that feather shaft and you go down towards the thalamus, that's actually the younger part of the feather. And that's something that we can actually use and you'll see that later. Um, the other thing I think is good to know is that the follicles or the number of follicles that the bird has, that's determined after embryogenesis. After that, it is fixed. But from those follicles, they can grow multiple feathers. So bird is born with their downy feathers, but then they molt uh, a couple of times and they get their juvenile feathers and their adult feathers. And that's how it changes. And that has a quite specific pattern to it. So usually they start molting the wing feathers. And even within the wing feathers, there's a very clear um, pattern. So they molt sequentially. So they start with the inner wing feathers. Uh, so those are the lower numbers. So those are the closest to the body and only once. And then keep molting on until they reach the outer wing feathers. Um, and that's what you see in that graph. It's quite old. Um, a lot of the literature about feather development, feather growth is quite dated, but it gives very detailed accounts. Um, so there's different colors. They represent different generations of feathers and the different uh, shading. So the shaded area is when the feather is still growing, so it's immature. And then the solid area is where the feather is actually mature and fully grown. And so you can see that sequential pattern very nicely how those feathers uh, mold. This is a graph from laying hens, but they've also done this for turkeys um, and also some more older reports there. But uh, we actually updated that for turkeys a few years back. Um, and we actually went in, measured all 10 primary feathers on I think 45 birds for a good 20 weeks with a whole team of students. because It's not easy handling these large birds. Um, in the beginning, it's fine when they're huge and small, and then they grow up very fast. Um, but you see the same pattern there, that sequential molting that happens in those primary feathers. And really, the take-home message here is that those feathers are growing over different points in time. And if you stick around long enough, I'll explain why we actually did this whole exercise later on. The other part I wanted to talk I'll touch a little bit upon is some of the genetic differences we see in different breeds of chickens and in their feather copper. So there's some variants there. Um, so this is an example of our naked neck chickens. Here's something that happened in the development. It's a mutation where the follicles don't distribute to the neck. So there's no follicles, so there's no feathers that are growing there. So as these chicks grow up, um, there won't be any feathers, and this is a breed that, for that reason, is suitable for um, more tropical climates with thermal regulation. Um, one other example that I came across is a mutation in feather structure. So this is what they call a bristle chicken. Never seen or heard of it before, but it's quite interesting. So instead of the feather angling around the body, it's actually twisted, and it curls upwards and outwards. So you get these birds that pretty much kind of look like they're constantly on static. Um, but yeah, it's more of a breed for showing. And then there's a few also differences between sex and in growth rates. And this is actually something people have used. So they worked in slow feathering rates or emergence to actually help with feather sexing of day old chicks. So a way to just Distinguish the males from the females. Um, companies often want to be able to do that um, with feathers as well instead of the fence sexing, which is more expensive, uh, more labor intensive, and more difficult. Um, I don't know exactly how I don't do this job, but uh, it's supposed to work. And other early interest in feather cover uh, really came more from a production point of view. So differences in metabolic rate and in production, they realized in poor feathered birds that those were increased. So they saw things like 
higher feed intake, um, a lower egg production, and then consequently, those birds have a lower efficiency, which from a production point of view, you want to avoid. There's different reasons why a bird may have poor feather buffer. Um, you saw that just now, we can have genetics playing a role or development, but also things such as nutrition or disease or the housing system or behavior play a role. And behavior is where I'm going next because that really is the area of research where I do most of my work. Um, as mentioned, I worked a lot on feather pecking behavior and this is something that's really a, a welfare problem in different poultry. Um, it's a behavior where there's different forms of it and it can be more severe, it can be more gentle, uh, where they more pack at the tips of the feathers, but even that can already cause some damage. Or it can be a case where they're actually pecking at and pulling out each other's feathers. So the consequences of that is that you can actually have birds that get those native patches, um, they can have more severe injuries or mortalities. And the issue is, is that we still don't really know what's causing it, but it's very much a problem in commercial birds. It's not something that you would uh, see in wild birds that much, which is probably also why you wouldn't find this in that list of functions. Um, it's not really a behavior that we're commonly seeing, but it is something that happens in laying hens. You see it in turkeys as well. And the consequences can be quite severe. So we don't know exactly what's causing it, as I mentioned, um, but there is a quite good understanding that it is multifactorial and that it is triggered by stress. So it's sort of the individual animal and it's environment, both social and physical environments that determines in the end what kind of behavior they will show, if they will start packing or not. And so that's gotten a lot of attention. It's especially relevant now that um, we're seeing these housing transitions, uh, for example, in laying hands in particular, where we're more and more moving away from the cage systems and start keeping these birds in these larger flocks, larger groups. Because while feather pecking can happen in all of the housing systems, consequences of that behavior can be much larger in those larger groups. Um, first of all, because it spreads much faster. And when you have more birds, you have more access to potential victims. Um, and also because we know from playing research that feathers that are damaged are actually the feathers that get uh, more pecking. They attract more pecking as well. And we did a little bit of work where we saw sort of a similar trend in turkeys. Um, it's slightly different because here we were looking at different injuries. So in this case, injuries on the hatch or the neck area, which in the case of turkeys, they don't have feathers there. Um, so that's more a form of aggressive pecking. But birds that had those injuries were also more likely to have injuries on their back, which is most likely feather pecking related. And that is something that I think is important to be aware of, at least that that can happen um, because it can have implications for the overall welfare of the animals and it might influence also how we will manage these sort of issues. And that is really a, a large focus of a lot of the research when it comes to feather packing. It's very much applied and trying to figure out what are the risk factors what are the potential management strategies that farmers can use because they're trying to find solutions for um, the current situation. And so there's quite a lot of literature there, um, but as I said, it's quite difficult because we don't know the exact cause. So you're having papers um, where they identify more or less 50 to 80 different management strategies that people can apply and then good luck trying to find what works. So. There is no silver bullet, unfortunately. Uh, that's not a very encouraging message, but what these studies did nicely show was that it seems the more mentioned strategies you actually implement, the less problems you will have with feather pecking, with feather damage, or with mortality. Um, basically, the idea is to keep that welfare at an optimal level or as much as you can, because you don't want to accidentally stress out the birds or trigger any sort of feather packing outbreak. So they're trying to avoid it 
that way. But you can imagine that does mean that it stays a concern for farmers. It's, it's not something that they can very easily solve when it starts. So that does keep them busy. Um, but also there, there's differences between farmers in general. Um, when do you consider fed packing a problem or not? And this is something that uh, this study by Kosinski et al, they showed that quite nicely. Um, so they had farmers look at photographs of different flocks with different uh, rates of feather packing or feather damage, and then ask them if we put them in order, best to worst, and put a line to it. Like from which point on do you say this is not acceptable anymore? And so you can see this farm, for example, was quite strict. Uh, we only said, okay, three of those photographs are still within the acceptable range. But other farmers react differently to that. So some of them are also saying, okay, I'm going to say these six photographs are actually still acceptable. This is okay. I will accept this in my flock. It also has an implication for when people will take action. Some farmers will already do something when they see only one bird perform better packing behavior. Others will wait until they see those uh, bald patches or if they actually see injuries or mortalities, so there's a difference there. Um, so that research for applied management strategies is continuing a lot and it's very needed, but I think there's also an increased call for more fundamental research because we're really trying to get, okay, what is the exact cause of feather packing? What are the underlying biological mechanisms? What other processes may be influenced or involved? And that honestly is something that could be an entire series of seminars on its own. So I'm going to not go into that into too much detail anymore, because I want to talk more about some of the other behaviors where feathers play a role. Because you can see on that bottom figure, the damage to the feathers uh, can be quite extreme as it deteriorates. And as we just saw, if these feathers are used in 26 other functions, uh, that could potentially go further than just feather packing. So locomotion, I mentioned. Um, in this case, we're mostly looking at laying hens. Um, but these birds, they need their feathers for flight, for balancing, for wing assist, incline running, which you just saw in that bottom video. So Trying to understand how those feathers play a role in those behaviors is quite new and quite interesting. Um, that's more recent work, and it's really work that's being developed and led by Dr. Alexander Harlander, um, together with collaborators, Dr. Don Powers and Dr. Brett Tobasva from the US. These are people who are really experts when it comes to avian flights and biomechanics, but they work with wild species most of the time. So it's very interesting to see how we can use some of their knowledge and their ways of working and try then to implement that in our commercial poultry or our laying hen research, which is quite different circumstances usually that you're working in. And this is work is being pushed by quite a large team of people. Um, there's people in the room who have been working on this. And there's also a lot of people before me who were working on this because this started actually before I joined. So some of that earlier uh, research, for example, already was looking at how feathers may influence balancing behavior on perches. And what they found was that actually birds that have feather damage, they leave that perch earlier and they perform more uh, rotational corrections as well. And you can see on that picture um, the damage to one of the wing feathers of these birds. So it's maybe not as extreme as that earlier picture where the chicken was more or less completely bald. But even here, you can see already some damage. You see some gaps in between those feathers. It's more frazzled in general. And so even small changes can already have uh, quite an impact there. And Laying ends, especially now that we're talking housing transitions or keeping birds more in aviary systems where they actually have to go up, they 
rely on those wings to go up ramps or to fly up and down if they want to access certain resources. So if you have feather damage for whatever reason, not just feather packing, but also from the housing system itself perhaps, or because there is a disease or there's a nutritional issue, that can have an influence because first of all, you're changing the shape of the wing, you're changing the integrity of the feathers, and it decreases the wing area in total. And if you decrease the wing area, then you have a bird that has increased wing loading. So what that means is that it's a bird with the same body weight, still has to support its own weight to go up, but it has a smaller wing surface to actually do that. So it will become harder. Um, they might try to compensate for that with increased wing flapping or increasing the wing beat amplitude. Um, but also just changes in flight pattern, for example, could happen with that. And this is something that is maybe a little bit hard to study in sort of normal con commercial conditions because you cannot really influence it where birds will pack it, if they will pack at the wings or some other part of the body. Um, so we did this in a more standardized way where we actually manually manipulated the wing feathers. So we clipped um, primary and secondary wing feathers in the fully clipped, only the primaries in half clipped birds, and then we had a control group that let the wing feathers intact. And these birds were housed more fence, but those four fans had elevated um, platforms with resources on them. So feeders, nest boxes, and they had been adapted so that only one bird could visit at a time. And they had RFID technology. So we could very precisely see, okay, which of the birds are still going up and how much time are they spending at those different resources. And I'm just gonna show one of those results um today because if you look at the behavior here um we first measured at week zero this is before we applied the clipping treatment but then if you look over time what happens in these different groups of birds is that over time those birds in the fully clipped group spend much more time on the ground or at the ground feeder uh, while the half the group actually still managed to go up, they still went to those feeders as well. And the control group also didn't really change their behavior. Now, we didn't just look at behavior in this, because we also looked at some physiology, particularly the muscles. Reasoning or our thinking was that if birds stop using their wings, stop using their uh, flight muscles, then those muscles may also change. Same as how when you stop going to the gym, you would think you would lose muscle mass there. Um, that said, we didn't want to kill these birds because we were doing longitudinal research. So we had to find a way that we could sort of estimate that on live birds. So for that, we used um, ultrasounds so that we could measure the thickness of these flight muscles, the pectoralis muscle because that is correlated with um, muscle mass and muscle size. And we looked at that six weeks later after we had applied those treatments, then actually there was a reduction in that muscle thickness in the groups that were half or full clipped, about 6% of a decrease there. So it seems that that decrease combined with that decrease in wing area, so an increase in loading is what's causing those fully clipped birds to be more rounded. Um, but in the half clipped birds, it seems that they still have enough of a wing area to actually move up. So that is good. Um, but we also want to see, does it change anything in the actual flight itself or flight pattern? So as mentioned, this is work that we rely heavily on our collaborators, uh, Dr. Brett Sobalski. He spent a lot of time patiently explaining us how we could set this up because he's done similar work with wild birds, a little bit different. Um, but what we have done was actually train our birds to jump off a, a high tower. So they would have to fly down to a particular target. 
and we had set up high speed cameras so we could measure very nicely their flight trajectory. And if you have good visual of that, you can put um, markers on very fixed points on the bird's wings and on their body. And if you trace that, you can actually determine wing and whole body kinematics. Now in this particular example, we didn't see any differences in the wing kinematics of these birds, despite that we quite seriously like decreased their uh, wing area. But we did see differences in the whole body kinematics. So descent angle, uh, vertical acceleration, horizontal acceleration, those differed. But actually what we thought was more interesting or more important is that all of the birds, also the ones with still intact flight feathers, were landing at speeds that were quite high. So that was for two to three times more that, that of more adapt flyers. So other birds that are known to be quite good at flying. Um, so all in all, it seems chickens are just not the best flyers, fortunately, uh, which makes sense. It's more of a ground dwelling bird. So they're, what we're thinking or what it's suggesting is that they're operating at their maximal power output and they're actually at their limits or at the limit of their ability to control flight. So that could have implications, could mean that they're more at risk for collisions, for example. And I think it also is important to realize that because if we already see this in our intact birds, and then if there is damage to those feathers, um, there's maybe a higher risk there. Right, and then I think the last part that I want to go over in this presentation, um, moving a little bit away from the behavior and more towards physiology, is this new area that's coming up where people are looking at feathers as markers. Um, so people have used feathers for example, for monitoring diseases, or if you look at the field of ecology, they use often feather samples, um, something simply because it's easier to collect feathers than actually trying to find your bird if you're um, working with rare species. And when it comes to our area of research, poultry welfare, there's um, quite some traction here in the recent years where people are trying to see if we can use that as well to especially measure glucocorticoids because it's avoiding some of the challenges that we would have if you would measure that more standardly, like what we would do with take a blood sample, for example. Um, because if you're looking at for pastrone in feathers, you're actually looking at the circulating corticosterone that's been deposited as the feather was growing. So as the feather is growing, there's still a blood supply to the feather and that corticosterone can be deposited, but then as the feather matures, the blood supply withdraws. And so after it's fully grown and there's no blood supply anymore, there's no corticosterone being deposited. So it's sort of a look back in the history of the animals and it's a longitudinal record. Um, of how that is deposited. It's not without its challenges. It's very early uh, that people have been starting to look at this a bit more. Uh, I think this audience in general understands that Google corticoids can play a role in many different processes. So the normal energy metabolism, it's uh, very important for that. So you always have to take it into a certain context and take more measures and understand what you're trying to measure. And that's really where I think a lot of the work that's has been done in the past few years and now are uh, focusing on. So a lot of them have, first of all, tried to see, can we actually measure the court costs from, from feathers with the ELISAs, for example, that we have, or the essays that we have. Is there a difference or is there variation between different types of feathers, which is uh, something most people are finding, and even within different groups of feathers, we're finding variation. Um, so, for example, even if you look within those wing feathers, and this is why we spent those 20 weeks actually going in with a ruler and measuring the feathers of turkeys, um, you're seeing differences there. And that's because it's important to understand that whole development and the growth of the feathers. So, uh, if you look at the bar chart, um, it's showing you when those feathers are grown. So if you would look at the primary one, you're actually measuring 
corticosterone that has been deposited between uh, week one and four, more or less. And if you would look at primary nine, you're capturing corticosterone that has been deposited from week three to 14. So that's a very different time period. So depending on what you're trying to do or what question you're trying to answer, that might determine or influence which better you end up selecting to actually sample. The other thing that these papers are hammering home is that, yes, you need to be aware of which feather you're sampling, but then once you've done that, you also need to make sure that you're sampling that same feather if you're, for example, uh, doing multiple birds or if you want to measure over time. Uh, but even if you're comparing or reading literature, if you're reading a paper where they measure this in teal feathers, you might get different results than when you read the same paper, but they're measuring it in wing feathers. So a lot of it has to do with providing context around what we're actually measuring. Um, but once you have a bit of an understanding of that, and once we figure that out a little bit more, there's quite some interesting things that people are doing with this. So I've picked out a few examples there on how people are using this. Um, so this was a recent paper by Johns et al. Um, they worked with ducklings and I yelled, this is poultry and we haven't really talked about ducks and ducks are cute. Um, mostly because I was hoping that they would have a video of the treatments that they did because they were looking at increased workload. So they gave these ducklings weighted backpacks. They had this obstacle tower that they built where they had to go over uh, all these obstacles and that's that I really wish we could have had a video of, but I'm sure if I go on YouTube, I will find something similar. Um, and then the last treatment they combined the two. But what they saw is that as these birds are growing, so the feathers are still growing, corticosterone is being deposited. Um, if they are under those increased workloads, they had higher levels of feather corticosterone, which they relate to the role it plays in energy metabolism. Then if we're talking about processes where energy metabolism plays quite a big role, big one would be egg laying. So again, turkeys, um, that first example, instead of relying here on the normal feather growth, we actually manipulated it again because we wanted to be sure that we were measuring the corticosterone that was being deposited as birds were coming into lay because that's a very energetically demanding process. But we had to be certain that those feathers were actually growing during that time period. So we went in, got our birds, and we plucked the wing feather, um, sampled that feather, and then later on came back 14 weeks later and then plucked the same feather again on our same birds. So we could actually see what that difference was from pre-lay to after the laying period. And we did find some differences there, but as you can see, it's depending on the genetic line. So it was only in one of the lines that we were seeing increases in corticosterone in their feathers. Another last study, they um, again looked at growing feathers, so younger birds, but they tried to see if we can actually pick up corticosterone if you're giving them drinking water supplemented with it, is that actually gonna end up in those feathers during that period as well? Um, there was quite a stark increase there. Uh, so I think it was a tenfold increase that they found. I'm not too sure why the variance in that uh, particular group, the treatment group is uh, also much larger, but it is quite interesting. And I think these are some of the earlier examples that how this may be used for what you can actually measure with it if you're looking at the corticosterone in feathers. And all of the work that I just talked about, the examples, especially from turkeys, all of that was sort of a foundation towards this capstone paper from Dr. Emily Fishman's PhD thesis, because we had been working within the group of Dr. Christine Days to try and find out if this was a heritable trait. And as far as I know, this is the first to actually report on heritability for feather corticosterone. I don't think there's any 
one that's done that before. Um, so it's quite exciting, but it turns out it is heritable. It's still very early. There's still a lot of other things that people would have to look at and figure out, but it does show or suggest that people could potentially select for something like this. But there's a lot of things that are happening in this particular field. Um, it's going to be quite interesting to see how that develops and what comes out of it. But I think as long as we are aware that we need to understand and give context to those different measures, um, that is very important. So that means we also still need to understand the biology and that feather development, feather growth, um, which I think is something that probably could use some updating um, from the very old data that we have. And then behavior-wise, feather packing, I think, remains quite a big problem, but it's also good to go a bit broader. Um, feather packing on its own is a big welfare issue, but I think, as we've seen those different functions of feathers, that it can have further implications that we may not have appreciated as much before. So I think that's important to keep in mind as well. And then I think I am wrapping up here. I only have an acknowledgement slides to keep up and then I'm good to answer any questions.